Are you a man looking for an intensive program to help you overcome sexually addictive behaviors? Gateway to Freedom is your answer. Gateway to Freedom is a three-day workshop for men seeking to overcome any destructive sexual habits. Whether married, single, or divorced, Gateway to Freedom will help men regain hope for a new life of purity and real contentment. The workshop is conducted by experts in the field of sexual addiction recovery with decades of combined experience. Read test testimonials of workshop alumni at gatewaymen.com get all the info and register online at gatewaymen.com or call 1-800-49-PURITY hi my name is jonathan and i'm the founder of the gateway to freedom workshop i want to personally invite you to register for our next workshop coming up july 14th through the 16th in colorado in the foothills of the majestic rocky mountains so call us today at 1-800-49-PURITY That's 1-800-497-8748 or visit gatewaymen.com. You're listening to Pure Sex Radio, training men, educating women. Brought to you by Be Broken Ministries. Visit us on the web at puresexradio.com. Good day, radio listeners. Welcome to this edition of the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. We're glad to have you with us. My name is Jonathan, and I'm your host, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, in this episode, sharing with you a, uh, a part of a webinar presentation that I did recently for the Apologetics Academy, and I'll share with you in a minute about how you can, can get the uh, full download of the webinar, but we're going to share with you a portion of that for this episode, and and it's going to come at a great time coming off the heels of our our last episode being with Dr. Julie Slattery and talking about holy sexuality and this concept of sexual discipleship and we want to continue that idea this week by being able to share with you uh God's design for sexuality that was the topic of conversation in this webinar uh but before I go ahead and plug you into that audio. Let me share with you a few highlights of just resources that I think can be helpful as you continue to explore and and work through uh, the, a biblical understanding of uh, sexuality and God's design. You know, we have a, an entire part of our ministry that's called Pure Community, and it's a it's a resource arm of our ministry. It, uh, it, we've got resources that are print materials. There is. Uh, there are even other podcasts and and uh, audio materials that are there as well. We've also got uh, an entire database of groups, support groups, and and counselors all across the country that you can find uh, local support. Also, we've got um, events that are listed there, intensive workshops, and uh, all kinds of resources. And I want to just strongly encourage you that as you continue your journey towards living a life of sexual integrity and and living out this design that God has given us for our sexuality, that you visit purecommunity.org. That's the website, purecommunity.org, and explore all the various materials that are on there. We have resources for men, for women, for couples, for parents, for teens, um, just any any person that has an issue with any kind of sexual brokenness or just wants to learn how to grow into this design that God has given us for our sexuality. I also want to make mention of one other event that's coming up. Uh, This is for men. We have our Purity Mentor Training Seminar that is coming up July 22nd in San Antonio. So if you're a man who is uh, doing well in terms of living according to this design that God's given us, none of us do it perfectly, but you're in a spiritually good place. You're in a place where you are um, living out this design well. I mean, there's some stability, in, and you would like to seek ways to help other men in their journey of pursuing greater integrity. This training seminar can be an incredible help in that. It's a one-day seminar to help men mentor other men towards purity. And so you can learn all about the Purity Mentor Training Seminar at puritymentoring.com. So that's Purity Mentoring. Dot com. Well, without any further ado, let me uh, get us to the the webinar. So, hope you enjoy this, and and I'll be back with you after 
this segment. If you would like to download the full webinar, simply go to apologetics-academy.org and then search under webinar recordings. Again, that's apologetics-academy.org and click on webinar recordings. We, uh, um, Jonathan also has a handout on this, uh, which I'm linking to in the chat, which you can download if you would like to follow along there as well. So do you want to uh, take it away, Jonathan? Sure, yeah. So we've, we've touched on a few of these already, but I wanted to just highlight, hi highlight them a little bit more specifically. So I have four, four points that I usually try to make when I'm talking about what is God's design for sexuality. And I'm, I want to make it very clear. I, I'm, I'm just a regular guy. I actually don't have any letters after my name. So I'm not Dr. Darty, you know, or anything like that. I feel like all of my understanding has been born out of my personal journey and just my unquenchable passion for the word of God. And so, um, I mean, I love, I love apologetics. I love the idea that we've been charged to give a reason for what we believe. We're supposed to be able to be ready to give an answer. And so when it comes to this issue of God's design for sexuality, I believe there's four key aspects to that. I believe the, the first part is uh, our sexuality is for bearing God's image. Because we're told in Genesis 127 that God said, let us make man in our image. So it said in the image of God, he created them. Or in the image of God, he created him. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. So the idea is there's this male and female aspect that God said from the very beginning is what his image would be born out in. And this is one of the ways I also believe that we are absolutely separated from every other thing thing in creation, animals and everything else. Because I, I think there's, I'm going to share with you five things that I think are part of this image of God that we bear. And I think there's many, many more, but I, I just, I want to share these five. One is the image of God is personal. And so while God has spoken everything else into existence and created animals and all these other kinds of things, there is a, there is a personal uh, connection that he has with us. We, we have our um, we have this personal aspect of God that he's placed on us in terms of image. There, there's also reason. We have been given this ability to reason, and there's an intellect that we have that is different. There's an intellect that we have that is higher than instinct. And that's one of the biggest differences, I believe, between humans bearing the image of God and all of the other animals in creation is animals operate out of instinct. We have this intellect that is from God that allows us to transcend and even deny instinct, which is why I think we have this uh, moral order that is recognized throughout all of the world, even by those who reject Jesus and reject God. There is still a moral order in the world, and I believe that has to do with this ability that we have to reason. I also think bearing God's image means there's a will. We have this ability to act. Now, Animals act, right? But I don't think they're acting in the same way that we can make decisions. Our will is something, like I said, that can transcend just instinct. We can make a decision while at the same time we have an urge to go one way, we can make a decision to go the other way. Uh, and I find it uh, odd that that can happen at least to a large degree throughout the rest of the animal kingdom. There's also this ability to be creative uh, in bearing God's image. And then finally, there's a holiness. There's a set-apartness that God has placed on us being those who bear his image. Now, why am I telling you this in relationship to sexuality? I mean, it's sexuality is for bearing God's image, but if you think about it, all of these aspects of his image can only be expressed through our sexuality. And what I mean by that is through our maleness or through our femaleness. In other words, we don't make a decision as an act of our will that's disconnected from the fact that we're male or female, even though it's not a sexual decision. In other words, another way that I can describe this is there is a there is a masculine identity for how we might think and process the world. And there is a feminine identity for how we might think and process the world. And I believe that when God said he will make us in his image male and female, that he was saying the full expression of the bearing of his image is only found 
in the two combined, not in just male or just female. And we see this throughout scripture. I mean, there's ways in which even Jesus expressed things through what we might even call a feminine expression uh, for when he said, oh, Israel, that I would gather you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks. That's very motherly talk. And I'm not trying to be sacrilegious or anything, but I believe those are the kinds of things that we see the fullness of the expression of God's image in the masculine and the feminine. And so therefore, sexuality, we were made male and female as a way to express and bear God's image through these things of reason and will and personality and creativity and holiness. So that's one way in which I believe that we are, um, that that's God's design for sexuality. Another part of his design for sexuality is the obvious. It's for procreation. I, I mean, sexuality, sex is the way that the species is, is continued. But sometimes um, we don't necessarily tie that always with the spiritual implications of that or the the God thinking behind that. We think, oh, yeah, you know, that that we're just like the animals in that regard. But if you think of it from the idea of we are meant to bear God's image, and then he said, be fruitful and multiply. When he said, I'll make man in my image, male and female, he created them. Then it says that he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. And that's different from earlier in Genesis when he said to the, the animals to be fruitful and multiply is because the animals don't bear his image. So the fruitfulness and the multiplication that's happening through humans is different than the fruitfulness and the multiplication that's happening through mere animals. Because the fruitfulness and the multiplication that's happening through us is meant to multiply the image of God on earth. And in that respect, you can see this procreation element of sexuality as a way that God wants to build his kingdom, expand his kingdom, more and more image bearers on the planet. But then also the third aspect of God's design for sexuality is for building intimacy. And we see this in Genesis 2, when we get a little bit clearer picture, a little bit more detailed picture of what God was doing in terms of creating Adam and then bringing Eve as the suitable helper or the helper who would fit Adam. And it's then that Adam, when he wakes up and he sees this beautiful woman and, and he just kind of loses his mind and is saying, for this reason, a man shall, and notice he's looking at her, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There is something about this oneness that God has said sexuality is part of that. But here's the interesting thing. When you look at the issue of procreation, so simply, you know, sperm fertilizing an egg and a new life is is created, and this issue of intimacy, but when you put them together, there's a, there's a Hebrew word that is used fairly often for this kind of an idea of the sexual union in a marriage, and it's the word yada, and it simply means to know. Now, it's used in a lot of different contexts, so it's not just used about sexuality, but I find it interesting that this is a word that's used fairly often and repeatedly about Adam knew his wife or so-and-so knew his wife. And it's in that sexual connotation, but it goes deeper than that, because this is about an intimacy knowledge. This is about knowing some, someone. It's not simply about being sexual, because there's a, several other Hebrew words that can be used just for intercourse or just sexual behavior. And yet so often is the case when we're talking about this issue of a husband and a wife, this word, yeah, the is known. And it's also used of God knowing his people and his people knowing him. So one of the designs that God has for our sexuality is an intimacy building that's meant to happen within this marriage that is intended to be a, a picture for us, even possibly a feeling for us of what the kind of intimacy that God desires to have with his people and that he wants his people to have with him to 
yada him, to know him. And I know it can, it can sort of make us feel a little uncomfortable or feel a little, you know, squirm a little bit to think, why would God use the same word for this sexual intimacy in marriage for the kind of intimacy that he wants to have with us? Well, if you think about it, there is not a deeper human expression of intimacy that we can experience other than sex. I mean, it is the deepest human expression, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental kind of union that two human beings can have. And so I think it's the perfect picture. And I think, I don't think, I know God knew this. God knew this is the perfect picture to show just the kind of depth of closeness, intimacy, pleasure, feelings that I want to be expressed between me and my people. And then finally, the last part of what I believe is God's design for sexuality is that God's design for sexuality is it's meant for proclaiming the gospel. In Ephesians 5, when we're giving these instructions about husbands and wives, we're, we're told that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. But then Paul goes on to say he uses the very phrase that we find in Genesis Therefore, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And he says, this mystery is profound, but I say that it has to do with the church and Christ. So he's making a correlation here. He's saying, listen, this is not merely, this is not merely about a husband and a wife having sex. This has a gospel message. This is about Christ and his church and the kind of unity and oneness that Christ longs to have with his people. And so, therefore, we are intended as Christians that our, even our sexuality be pointing people to the gospel. That it's not merely about a sexual act, but this, this incredible union and this covenant bond of one man with one woman in marriage in that sexual union and in that covenant. That is an expression. That's a gospel expression. That is an expression to point people to Christ and his church. And so therefore, those are, those are some of the key elements that I've seen in terms of what does it mean? What is God's design for sexuality? It's for bearing his image. It's for procreation. It's for building intimacy. And it's for proclaiming the gospel. So the bottom line then is that I believe that the design and purpose that God has made sexuality for is to bear his image and build his kingdom. And if you look at the four that I've pointed out there, if you look at the first and the third, bearing his image and building intimacy, those have a lot to do with that first part, bearing his image. I mean, building intimacy is really about bearing the image of God, not building our own image, but actually bearing his image. And then if you look at the second and the fourth one for procreation and proclaiming the gospel, that's really about building the kingdom. And so this is a simple way to maybe break down uh, what can be much more involved in deep theological issues in terms of sexuality and the gospel and all that. But I've tried to just lay them out here in a, in a simple way to be able to maybe communicate that to others hopefully invite other believers to really embrace this and realize there's a bigger vision to our sexuality than simply not doing sinful behaviors and saying, oh, listen, it's just this private act that we do in marriage. No, it, while it is a private act we do in marriage, it is connected to such a larger vision of what are we doing to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ through how we bear his image in our sexuality. So I believe this. I believe that every sexual decision we make is a spiritual decision. Now, I don't believe that every spiritual decision we make is a sexual decision, but I do believe that every sexual decision we make, what we choose to look at, what we choose to say, behaviors we choose to engage in sexually, every single one of those is not just a behavioral decision, it's a, it's a spiritual decision. And so I think we have this connection to the larger vision of bearing his image and building his kingdom. It makes us think about every decision we make regarding our sexuality. And so I'd love to get feedback. I'd love to hear questions. I'd love to hear uh, whatever other input you might have in terms of saying, hey, this is also, these are other things that are part of the design that God has for sexuality. Because I won't pretend 
for a second that I have exhaustively or comprehensively, you know, presented this issue. Absolutely. Yeah, that was really great. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, a major reason why pornography and prostitution and other related things ultimately cheapen and devalue sexuality because sexuality as designed by God is something which is sacred. It's meant to be a sacred union between a man and his wife. Um, and to take it that way and cheapen it um, is to rob it of its design and intent. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I believe the enemy is so intent on getting us entangled in sexual sin, because it's not simply about sex. It's about the image of God and the propagation of his kingdom, the, the, the expanding of his kingdom. And because I believe there's a direct link to those in terms of his image and his kingdom, it makes sense that the enemy would go right after that very thing. Because if he can, if he can, if he can tear apart marriages, what is he essentially doing to the watching world? He's tearing apart the image of God before the watching world. This image yeah. of Christ in His church. Absolutely, and it. I mean, um, as you've said, the paradigm of sexual addiction and pornography is the self. You know, me, um, my needs. It's about you know how can I use this person to uh, to get pleasure for myself rather than and which is the complete reverse of what a covenantal marital union should be about which is about you know how can i serve this other person you know how can i uh, meet this other person's needs um rather than and with pornography i mean you watch an image and you're either you're 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 satisfied you're either satisfied or you're not satisfied if you're not satisfied well you just flick on to the next person and if you are satisfied there's going to come a point where you're no longer satisfied with that person because it doesn't mm -hmm. get you that high and so then you're on to the next person um and that's really the i mean no woman can compete with an endless stream of constant novelty mm -hmm. and you um, know what that's why i always like to remind people when when they're reading in philippians and um when Paul is, you know, we, we've so pulled out of context the I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we make that like a power verse when, in fact, it's a contentment verse. And what I've found is what you're talking about there is pornography and sexual sin and lust is always aiming to create a perpetual sense of discontent in our lives through our sexuality. And so if we can recognize this idea of we can find our satisfaction in Christ, we can find our satisfaction in healthy relationships, then we can see the lies of lust for what they are and realize this is trying to attack my contentment and get me to, to think that I don't have enough or that, that, that my wife isn't enough or that this pornography is going to satisfy. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, um, you know, and, and this actually leads to a lot of sin, not just uh, sexual sin, but one of the root causes of sin is that people, that is that Satan deceives us into believing that God is not good, that you know God owes me something, that God um, has withheld from me something, and so we throw ourselves a pity party, and uh, and and that mm -hmm. ultimately leads to us you know falling prey to temptation and sin. Well, that's exactly what happened in the garden, isn't it? Just create that little sense of doubt that God's withholding something from you. And then all of a sudden, what was forbidden looks very tasty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, an anonymous viewer asks, how does someone make a positive case um, of the superiority of a biblical perspective of sexuality to sexual anarchy? This can be done both biblically and scientifically. Yeah, I would say, you know, the first thing that comes into my mind when I think about this is, I don't know if it's as much about making an argument as, as it is about living the ethic. And what I mean by this is I believe that the best apologetic that we have for the Christian ethic is how we manage our lives sexually. So therefore, if you want to make a positive case of the superiority, so to speak, of the biblical perspective, then it means we must take seriously the call to obedience that we have been given in terms of let there not even be a hint of sexual immorality among God's people. So therefore, we need to take passages like Ephesians 5, 3 seriously and say, Lord, examine me, you know, take me 
to the mirror and show me if there's anything in me that is a hint of sexual immorality because I want to be able to express through my life, not just my words, but through my life, that positive sexual ethic that comes through your your uh, your word. Now, I, I'm, that may sound like a cop out answer or whatever, but I really do believe that's what it's going to take. If we want to see a wave of real revival in terms of um, promoting and and promoting sexual purity and, and God's design for our sexuality, it really does have to eventually get down on a personal level and say, well, I would love to see it happen all across the world. What am I doing about what I'm, what I'm looking at and what I'm engaged in. And so make it a personal mission. And then little by little, the way God does that through multiplication is astounding. And that's how a movement I think occurs in terms of being able to give that positive um, Christian perspective that says, wow, I've tried this over here and I'm seeing a real radical transformation Mm -hmm. in this guy over here. What's, what's different with him? Well, I hope you were encouraged by those words. Uh, this is good news that God made us male and female, that that he made us sexual beings to bear his image. And so if you've got questions, if you're struggling with living out this beautiful design that God has given to us in our sexuality, we would love to help. Please contact us. Uh, you can go to purecommunity.org to get some resources. Uh, Or you can reach out to us by phone at 1-800-497-8748 or go to our website at puresexradio.com and we've got resources and help for you. So we look forward to seeing you back here again next time and have a blessed week. Pure Sex Radio is paid for by Be Broken Ministries. Visit us online at puresexradio.com.